Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I guess we can start. So it's our great pleasure to have uh, Genoa here today. He's visiting uh, the lab. So Genoa has a degree in both uh, economics and computer science, and uh, is now currently final year PhD student at the Caltech, where he's advised by Professor Virman and Professor Lowe. And uh, his PhD thesis is about, uh, well, as you can guess from the title, you know, energy efficiency, you know, IT, in particular, like, you know, with cloud computing, both across data center and within data center. And uh, his work has been uh, widely recognized by the research community. He's got a couple of best paper awards for uh, the work uh, of his PhD. As well as also in the industry settings, he has been uh, collaborating with uh, HP in order to help them developing like an energy efficient data center. And today, you know, he's going to talk about, you know, his, uh, his research. So thanks yeah. a lot. And Thank over you. to you. Yeah. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, I really like this, this building. It's, it's very nice. And, uh, and also, it's, it's a one hour talk. I gave a half an hour session. Uh, last week in, at Imperial, but this time we have the luxury to have one hour, which can can show the work in a little bit depth. So uh, nowadays, energy and sustainability have become one of the most critical issues for our society. While the abundant potential of renewable energy, such like wind and solar, present a, a real opportunity for sustainability, their intermittency and uncertainty is a, a daunting operating challenge. Therefore, for my work, I focus on to develop analytical models and uh, deployable algorithms and eventually go to industrial transfer to enable efficient integration of renewable energy into our uh, IT system and further our general power system. So during the talk, OK, can you do me a favor, please? So uh, uh, I, I really hope by the end of the talk, you can give me an any comments you, you have on my talk. So, yeah, since this is, it's usually very hard to get this kind of comments since people are usually too friendly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's start. So, okay, this might not be a good example, but uh, uh, let's to Google it. <laughs> okay, so uh, people are using Google services, and uh, uh, but not everyone knows this costs Google more than one million server. And uh, what does this mean for sustainability? So, the emission of one server is comparable to a car. And together with all the other IT companies, and the total emission of IT is comparable to the airline industry. So, so imagine how many flights we have every day, right? And also as a building block for cloud computing, data centers consume about 2% of the world electricity consumption. Uh, what does that mean? If we aggregate uh, the, all the data centers as a country, and we name it the United Data Centers, and that's why we name countries. Right? And then is electricity consumption on an annual basis is comparable to the United Kingdom. And to make it even worse, this part is increasing very fast. It's much faster than total electricity consumption. So that means currently it's 2%, but if we do not do things in the right way, uh, just in 10 years, it will be 5%. So this is very important. And recently, Greenpeace have two very interesting reports. One is how dirty is your data, one is how clean is your, your cloud to call for attention, but more importantly, actions on this important area. So for my own research, yeah, OK, as a researcher in networking and system, that's why I'm so interested in, in this group. Uh, back to my master's study in Tsinghua University, I, I'm mostly focused on, on router architecture, on, on protocol design. So there, and this is my home area. But during the past five years, I saw a new dimension emerging, which is energy accessibility. Almost all the traditional area, now they care about energy, they care about power, they even care about the climate change and the ecosystem. Okay, this can be divided into two parts. One is to make our IT system more sustainable. One is to use IT to improve the sustainability of our society. So my work is, is going along both lines. For this one, I have the geographical load balancing, which I will discuss a little bit in this talk. And I also worked with HP for three years to 
design and implement the industry first net zero energy data center. It's got the computer world order last year. And for the second one, I'm only recently I'm most focused on demand response. It's an interdisciplinary challenge for both engineering and economics. Okay, here, okay, as you, you might say, this, this is a key word maybe for my application. So Sigmetrics is my home conference. It's, it's parallel to SICOM, but more, focus more on the, the performance evaluation, more theoretical side. SICOM nowadays is really hard to see any formulation, any mathematics there. But okay, Sigmetrics is a conference uh, focus a little bit more on the theory side. Okay, I will start with the, the, the simple IT part. As we see, this is an important area, so we have all the huge pushes from both academia and industry. So as a result, the power usage effectiveness of, of PUE, which is defined as a power into the building divided by the power used by IT system, which is used to do the real work, is greatly reduced during the past decade. It's reduced from more than three to just 1.1 for the state of our data center. What does that mean? For three, it means for each kilo hour power used by our server, there are two kilo hours wasted on the cooling and the power distribution. But 1.1 means we have 90% utilization. Right? This is very good, but, uh, but what's missing there? Right? So the first one is a lower power cost, lower PUE does not necessarily mean lower energy consumption. Right? If we make this IT system worse, and it can actually reduce this one. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, one of the tricks all the IT companies are playing now. What they do is they remove, they, they actually move the cooling need from the chiller to the fans on the server. Once it's in the server, like the laptop, right, you cannot, it's really hard to distinguish between the power from the fan or the power from the, the, the IT system. Therefore, by doing that, they can reduce PUE, but it doesn't reduce their, their energy consumption. More importantly, is that even a low energy consumption does not necessarily mean sustainability, because we need to care about how much power is from renewable sources. This is also a very important problem nowadays, because more and more data centers, they are built at a location with very cheap electricity price, but at the same time, very dirty. So for my research, I focus on improve the sustainability to make data centers more sustainable. And the goal here to power data centers with renewable energy. Okay, for data center here, on the demand side, we have IT demand we need to finish, and then we have other overhead. On the supply side, we have local renewable generation, such like the Apple new data center in uh, North Carolina, I guess, it's, I remember, if my memory is correct. So there, they have a 20 megawatt PV panel, which is, is a huge area. And also, it can also use the power from the electricity grid or power grid with possibly time varying electricity price. Okay. Demand and supply, they are both dynamic and uncertain, and they do not necessarily match each other. Right? This is one example of an already very optimized data center in the power consumption. Okay. Here, the red curve is the PV generation. It's measured on top of building. And this is IT power with IT capacity constraint. The brown bar is cooling, but we, we really want it to make look like this, through workload management. So what makes this possible is workload is flexible. This flexibility is twofold. The first one is the flexibility in time. Okay. If we take a closer look, we actually have two kinds of workload. One is inter interactive workload, like Bing search. Right? When we click the search, we expect the result to come back in one second. So we are very unsatisfied. But we also have another class of batch job, like the, the background indexing all the things and the scientific computation, all of that. For this kind of workload, we have much larger flexibility. We can do it at any time as long as we finish before the deadline. We still have a deadline, but uh, it's much more flexible. For example, at HP, we have one uh, huge image processing job for this thing that takes several weeks to finish. So nowadays, the, the big data and the, a lot of big data applications, they really take a really long time to finish. And there is almost a no uh, e 
emergency for finish them just, just as fast as possible. So for this one, we can do the demand shaping to make it uh, to better utilize renewable generation. And uh, I also work on the life cycle analysis and optimization. And uh, e even from the starting point to when you build a data center, you need to consider for each part how much you want to provision. And uh, uh, the second part is, in my mind, more unique in our IT system is uh, the, the flexibility in space. For example, yeah, uh, the basic idea is that we can decide which data center to serve the request on the, in a the, in the real-time manner, right? And uh, therefore, we need to deal with the distributed control and online control. Uh, because it's a large distributed system and uh, there are a lot of uncertainty in the future information. So this I will focus on in this talk. Okay, here, what do you mean by, by geographic load balancing? Okay, uh, again, oh, sorry about that, I take a Google as an example. Okay, in the United States, but actually they have data center all over the world and they are doing this because probably to minimize their network delay to increase reliability, but this makes the routing challenging. To see this here in the system, the, the request will first go to a proxy or mapping node of front end server. And then this one will decide where to send the traffic to. Right? For this one, it might be sent closer, but the one in Colorado, it might split. Right? We, we call it energy aware routing or ear because we, it makes trade off between load balancing, network latency, and energy. All of them are time variant and location dependent. And given the routing decision, the data center will run dynamic capacity provisioning to decide the number of active servers for each time slot. Okay. And I have a demo here to show how this system works to do the follow the renewable routing in order to uh, ease the renewable integration. So here, the legend, okay, each circle is a data center. Okay. And, uh, the inner area means the, the number of active server in the data center with the out, out circle, that is the total capacity. The left hand side is the demand. We have the IT power demand and the cooling power demand. Right hand side is the supply. This, the red part is what we do not want. It's the, the power from the electricity grid. And these two are renewable generation. Okay, for each dot is a, a source. We have one source per each state. and. Uh, if there is a line between the, the source and the data center, there is traffic there. The thicker the line is, the more traffic we have. Okay. Then we start. Uh, we can say as time goes by, uh, the, the proxy will decide the, the data center to send, and the data center will, will change, adapt its size uh, according to the coming traffic and also the renewable generation. And, and another thing to, to notice is that we do not send the traffic from the east coast to west coast. It's too far away. But for the middle part, we, we might split uh, according to the renewable generation. Okay, by doing this, we can increase the renewable utilization, uh, but how to make this? We need a deployable and a distributed control with theoretical guarantee for this kind of follow the renewable routing. Okay. Uh, here, I think people all agree with deployable. What I want to convey is that we also need some theoretical guarantee. This is important if uh, when uh, when something goes wrong. And also the distributed is related to this system. I take Google as an example. Actually, a more interesting case I'm recently work with is Akamai. Akamai has thousands of data center just in the United States. So there, the distributed solution is very important for them. And uh, to do this, I found model to algorithm and to evaluate the impact and eventually to real system design. Throughout this process, okay, this is my research style. It's keep it both rigor and relevant. Okay, let's start with the model. And for proxy, we discretize the workload to each, for example, to each hour to get the workload for the current comes out uh, as LJ. And of course, for the, the relation between all the time slots, we have another paper work on the online algorithm, but I will not focus in this talk. 
But if you're interested, I'm always happy to discuss offline. The second, okay, given the total incoming load, the proxy need to decide the traffic sent to each data center, which is lambda IG. Lambda IG is the traffic going from proxy G to data center I. This is the energy of value routing. And the data center, we have all the informations, total number of server, capital MI, electricity price, PI, power usage, effectiveness, EI, maybe some renewable generation, RI, and uh, okay, the arrival rate is decided by the routing. Okay, lambda I is simply just a summation over J of lambda IG. Okay. Given this, the data center need to decide the number of active servers, small MI, for E time slot. This is a dynamic capacity provision. Okay, this is model. And for objective, we minimize both energy cost and delay cost. For energy cost, it's function of the number of active servers and also all, all the other parameters. For delay cost, we have FI as a delay inside the data center and the DIJ as a delay from the proxy to the data center, which is a network delay. For example, this is one example for energy cost. The number of active servers plus the uh, power usage effectiveness to get the total power minus renewable price of uh, electricity price. Here, we can use the MGR1 process sharing, queuing delay, and uh, to get this sample. Okay, these are two examples to help you to, under to better understand the, the objective, but for our algorithm design, we can work for general form. Okay, what do we minimize? This is our control variable. One is MI, is the number of active servers in at test I, uh, this is a dynamic capacity provision. And lambda IJ is a routing matrix. Right. The constraint we have, you need to finish all the traffic. Non-negative, this is just a constraint. Here, okay, I need to mention, we ignore the integer constraint because uh, these two numbers are usually very large, thousand, at a thousand level. And the last one is very challenging for distributed algorithm design. It's a, a total traffic for data center I should be smaller than the service rate of data center I. Right? Uh, this is a convex optimization with some mild assumption. And so we can solve it in a centralized way. But the, the challenge is how to make it distributed. Okay. The algorithm design part, lots of work before my work, they also work with the real system, but none of them provided the guaranteed optimality. Okay. Our idea, the first level idea, is that the separation between routing and the data center decision. Here, actually, the, the decision for each data center can be isolated very well, right? So each data center, just given my, the, the coming traffic, I will decide just for a local, by doing a local optimization, how many servers I want to keep active. So I have a question about this. Is your RI local to the data center? Is it assumed a local renewable, or is it? Yes, local renewable, exactly. But, but there's still a cost associated with it. Ah, sorry, say that again. There's still some cost to providing this renewable. But yeah, assume... that, that's why we have the, the life circle analysis. Uh, because the capital cost for wind and solar is very large. But once you already have it deployed, this is for the operational cost, right? During operational, the, the, the cost is very small. Okay, so this is okay. And once you get this, uh, the number of active servers, it will transferred or measured by the uh, proxies, and the proxies need to solve the routing matrix in a distributed way. This is challenging, but assume we can do this. And then this process going on, this is a traditional circle for distributed algorithm design. Then we can prove there is no performance loss from this separation in the sense of it still convert to the optimal solution. Okay, but what's remaining is this one, the, the routing decision. To see the challenge, okay, for example, if this is a feasible set for proxy G, okay, what's that? It has three constraints, right? The first one is you need to send out all your traffic. And second is non-active. Last one is for each data center, your traffic plus the traffic from all the other people should be smaller than the service capacity. But proxies are doing the update at the same time, right? And, uh, What's the traditional way to do this is from the current state, we calculate the gradient uh, direction. And if it goes out, we project back. But here we cannot do this because, first one, in order for this approach to decrease, for the objective function to decrease for this approach, we need the objective function to be Lipschitz. 
Lipschitz basic mean uh, it has a bounded uh, derivative if it uh, is differentiable. Okay, but uh, here the queuing delay we know that it goes to infinity. Uh, right? It's not Lipschitz, so we we cannot use this way. The second one is we we need to calculate in a distributed way, but the the constant is is not coupled. Uh, it's coupled. So what we solve this problem is that, okay, the first idea is that we assume we have an initial feasible set, feasible point. This point is just feasible. Uh, we do not need this to be optimal, but the feasible, it can be achieved by the uh, other reliability uh, mechanism of the system, right? From this one, we divide a level set. The level set means it contains all the points with objective value smaller than this initial point. Okay, what's the benefit of this one is this set is Lipschitz. So if we still do the gradient and project back to this one, then we can show it will make the function to decrease, and once it decreases, it's keeping in this feasible set. So it goes on, and we can do that. Okay. We solve the first challenge, but the second one is that when, when I draw like this, I basically mean only proxy G move, right? You assume all the other people don't do make any update, but that's not good for convergence, right? So how to make this? It turns out we have a very simple solution. That is, you just skew it down by the number of uh, active proxies. And by doing this, we can prove, although each one is updated at the same time, but aggregate them together, we still keep in this physical set and the objective function decrease fast enough. Okay, and here this proof is very general. We just need the function to be convex, no other assumption. And uh, given this, we can prove uh, for the sequence generated by our algorithm, every limiting point is optimal given the slab size is small enough. Okay, and uh, okay, let's let's have a little bit break here. And uh, I I sup I guess maybe some of you have already seen this figure before, and this is from PhD uh, cos cosmic. And uh, okay, what's this? The outer circle is a human knowledge. Okay, this is what we get after elementary school, and then we go on. And uh, then we go to the college, and now something happened here is we have a major, which might not be a good thing, but uh, that's the reality. And then you keep going around that direction for eventually the PhD, right? And uh, then you, you make some breakthrough, right? You get your PhD degree. And uh, okay, if this is the case, I should say for the theoretical side, what I just described the theory, the distributed algorithm design, it's actually one of my contributions here. Since before that, I I didn't see any work can do the distributed algorithm design without the Lipschitz condition. What they do is just assume the function is Lipschitz. Okay, but back to this one, the contribution is still negligible. So that's why we, we, we need to go on. Nowadays, I work with uh, localized control. If you know, Professor John Doyle at Caltech is a uh, big name in control community. Okay, now we come back to the technical part. And the other properties we have for, for it to be deployable, one is the convergence rate, right? And uh, here is the, uh, the convergence to an optimal solution. For the algorithm we designed three years ago, it converged already at an exponential rate. Uh, we have a new algorithm this year for transaction and networking, and uh, this can convert much faster. The reason behind this is that we do not follow the traditional approach. Since for, for optimization, what we can achieve optimality is when the KKT condition is satisfied, right? So for this algorithm, we directly go to the KKT condition to make it satisfied for each time step as much as possible. So it can convert very fast. And also, this. We have the, the, the idea of this algorithm uh, two years ago. And then we also have all the simulation to support it. It actually converged, but it takes two years to prove <laughs> it actually. So it's, it's actually says something seems easy is actually not easy. Yeah, go ahead. What is, what is the 
what is the time scale on that axis at which the world changes under you? With okay. Okay. So world? for for the time slot we consider now, it's one hour, right? And for each time step, it might be five minutes or one minute. Okay, that's the time scale we consider. And but what's but how I mean so when you know wind energy production changes even faster than every five minutes, right? Okay, the thing with that is uh okay, first of all, uh people usually believe when the when the energy distribution is a variable distribution, right? And in that sense, it does not change so fast. If from the current slot is kind of a random walk for the next one. But the solar can actually be very fast. Just one cloud goes by, right? It decreases to zero, right? Therefore, people already have some small storage inside both wind and solar to keep it uh, smooth in a very time slot, maybe one minute or five minutes. So that's why we, we basically do not need to worry about the, the, the fluctuation at the t that time scale. That they already handle it. But the, at the longer time scale, that's uh, the problem. And the second one is that people might worry the routing matrix is too complicated. But we can prove if in a graph, if we consider all the data centers and all the proxies as a node, if there is a traffic among them, there is an edge, then we can prove there exists a simple optimal solution that there is no circle inside that. And the proof is constructed. The last one is uniqueness. Generally speaking, the optimal the optimal solution is not unique, but we can prove the per server arrival rate is unique across all the optimal solution. Okay, then we evaluate the impact to both data center operator in terms of the cost in dollar and also to the environment in terms of the emission. Right? For the first, uh, setup, we have 10 location and we use the industrial electric price for each one and it actually varies a lot. For workload, we have one proxy per each state and we use a workload from Hotmail and uh, scale it by the uh, population with internet access uh, within each state. And the network latency is proportional to distance. Okay, then we can evaluate the first one. From data center operator's perspective, how much can we save uh, over a, a heuristic solution? By heuristic, I mean it's already very good. We compare with the baseline called local. Local means we still do the optimal dynamic capacity provisioning inside the data center. It's just for the routing, it's nearest routing. Okay, it's already, I think it's already much better than most of the industry practice now. And uh, for this one, in a two-day simulation, we can say we can save the cost up to 20%. The reason behind this is we save the energy cost quite a lot, but we only increase the delay a little bit, as you see in the demo. Yeah. We do not move traffic to a very far away data center. So this is saving what operator? saving electricity prices? Yes. So in a sense, you're trying to outsmart the electricity company. Oh, sorry. So, so essentially, you're trying to do, you're, you're providing renewable energy rather than uh, trying to optimize on prices if the electricity company provided the renewables in one sense. Oh, later you will see. We have also that kind of case. OK. Uh, this is a general work. It can use for, for different uh, objective. This is just for one objective. Since it's very straightforward for data center operator to focus on cost. Although we hope them can also focus on the on the externality, but in reality, Joy Nash told us people are selfish. That's why. And uh, okay, this is good for the cost, but for the usage, it can actually increase. The 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 idea behind this is that when you send the, the traffic to a further data center to utilize the, the cheaper electricity there, you need to use more server to serve the request to compensate for the larger network delay. Right? This is very bad. And uh, then we want to study how to make it also environmental friendly. The, the answer is to use it for follow the renewable routing. There are two approaches. OK, this is our objective. OK. This is something probably you cannot change as long as the data center operator is selfish. Right? But what we can change is that, first one, we can change the price. Right? We can change the price signal to make it more aligned with the renewable generation. The second one, we saw nowadays more and more data center already have a local renewable integration. And uh, okay, for the first one, okay, this simulation, we have the data center 
This is a renewable generation on east coast and west coast of the United States. And this is uh, the time difference there. Right? And also for the servers, the act number of active servers uh, under static pricing as a current practice look like this, also some uh, time difference. And if we can do dynamic pricing, have the form of kind of carbon tax, then we can show it actually can enable or motivate this kind of the follow the renewable road to send the traffic to the data center with more renewable. For the second one, we focus on the question of the local renewable capacity required to reduce uh, the, the, or the dirty energy usage by a significant amount. This is your part of your question. Right? This, since this uh, capacity, the, the capital cost is very huge. And uh, okay, this is a wind and solar capacity. When it's equal to one, it means the average generation equal to the average usage, average demand. If you just do local, it's very huge. It's, it's not feasible. If you can do geographical load balancing with even low electricity price, cheap electricity price, we can still save a lot. And we can do with high energy price, such like the India. Right? We know that the Indian electricity price is very high. Then we can save further. Okay. So for this one, what we have is that it is good for data center operator because it can reduce the operational cost. Uh, we have the distributed algorithm, but we also have an online algorithm design. And it can also be good for the society to, in, to ease the renewable integration if we can provide the right incentive for them to do the follow the renewable routing. Okay, then I go to the industrial implementation. Okay, the reason after the, behind this is that after my second year, I already have the Sigmetrics paper and the Anizer Best Paper Award. Then I go to my advisor, oh sorry, I went to my advisor to say I need to go to the industry to, to make a real impact. Right? So from then on, it's already three years. During the summer, I work full time with HBM. During normal time, I work part time. And we actually work on the implementation of this one. And what we have, we realized first is that for the routing part, although it's, it's not easy in the theory part, but it actually we have already a lot of techniques can incorporate this very easily. For example, Google has a global workload management. When I intend with Google in 2012, I can have the access to the data, to the code base of this one. And uh, it is very easy to in incorporate this one into their current uh, routing. So this part is okay. The data center part, actually this is very hard for industry. So what we do now is we leave all the servers on all the time. So there is an article last year in New York Times to criticize the data center just has a very low utilization. In that article, they claim the average utilization is only 10 to 15%. Why we have such a low utilization is we do not turn off or to sleep of the unused server. We just keep them on. That's the reality. So I work with HP for the data center. For this center, we have three parts, IT, cooling, and uh, power, right? These three are, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, they have impact on each other, right? And all the information are gathered by our capacity and uh, workload planner to get the schedule, to minimize the environmental impact, to minimize energy costs, and to still meet, uh, still meet the service level agreement of the, the workload. Okay, this is a system architecture. Okay, this is more like a sitcom talk now. Yeah, and uh, we have we predict all the information and we get all the parameter and the service operational goals to get our workload schedule and the resource provision plan for our runtime workload manager. For this one, we have the both the model and the control algorithm. It can be local just for one data center, and it can be global for the geographic load balancing. It doesn't matter. Just depends on how you use it for. Uh, for this one, it takes a long time to finish because here we work on the co-location of different kind of workload on the same server. We do the live migration of virtual machine. We also do the cooling optimization and also we have the uh, reactive control since we have the prediction error here. Right. So I have a demo here for the HP data center, what we are doing now. Right. Uh, okay, ignore the lower part, it's just a statistic. And here, the central part is IT system. 
I show three physical servers, but actually we have many more. When it is green, it means active. All the brown boxes on the server are virtual machine. This is a very powerful server. It has 24 CPU cores just for one server. And uh, this is a power part. We have the on top renewable generation, and we also use the power grid. There is a switch among these two. And for cooling, we can use oxide air cooling, and we can use a traditional chiller cooling. This is the time of the day and the oxide air temperature. Okay, now let's start. Now, since it's night, we don't have any renewable generation. Since the oxide air temperature is low, we use oxide air cooling. Right? And later, when we come to the day, we have more and more solar generation. Now we begin to turn on all the servers to serve the request. And since the oxide temperature becomes higher, we go to the traditional chiller cooling to serve the request. OK, it, it, it goes on. And later, you will see uh, it comes since during night, we don't have renewable generation. We go back to the situation, we just use one server. OK. So this is what our system looks like now. And uh, last year, oh, not last year, in 2012, HP unveils the, the architecture, and it got the, the computer world launched last year. And more important, this part, we already have the product called EaglePod Data Center. It is used by large IT companies such like eBay and Facebook. Okay. I, now I, I show a full circle, go from the analytical modeling to algorithm design, and eventually go to the industrial transfer. Okay. And the second part now is that the IT, in my mind, should play a, a, a more important role in our overall uh, infrastructure for our society. Uh, let's see. Now we have more and more renewable generation from the sustainability consideration. Actually, it's interesting to to realize there are actually three stages for our power grid. During the first stage, we care about the uh, cost, so we we try to minimize the cost. Then people have the, the concern about the, the reliability. And later, we try to improve the reliability and people care about the, the sustainability. And nowadays, we care about the sustainability, and the people worry about the cost. Right? So this is uh, the, uh, the power electricity, the power industry. OK, during the past 10 years, uh, the renewable generation increased a lot. And among this, wind and the solar actually dominate all the new capacity increase. And these two are, are, are very challenging for uh, our power grid. Because what we have is we need to uh, meet, we need to balance the supply with demand for the power grid. Otherwise, we have a blackout. It's not like our IT system. It's just your, your, your website goes down. It's here. It's your building, will go, the power will go down. What do we do? Traditionally, we predict the demand. And then we control the supply to follow the demand. Right? But now with renewable generation, the supply side is less controllable and have high uh, uncertainties here. Also, we can use battery or energy storage or reserve, whatever they call, to solve the, the problem. It's very expensive. So people are considering to make the demand side also responsive, to make the demand to follow the supply to some extent. Therefore, we need a huge growth in demand response. People are considering the electric vehicle, air conditioner, and uh, even pool pumps as a candidate for demand response. But in my mind, data center is also a promising option. Because they are very large loads, right? It's easy to control that a very large number of small loads. The second one is it's already highly automated, right? So the control knobs are already there. But if you want to control a, a air conditioner in your home, you need to install additional additional uh, equipment that costs money and the effort. And this part is also increasing for us, and uh, we have significant flexibility in the demand. And uh, this is in different level. Even in cooling and lighting, uh, we can already change some. Uh, we have some demand flexibility. My work focuses on workload management. And by default, data center should have the on-site backup generator and also the storage called UPS, right? the uninterrupted power supply system. So this can further add to the flexibility of our data center. So 
uh, this is uh, the most the, the most recent result. It's not the conference is in this June. So uh, what we have is that the worldwide data center can provide the energy storage capacity that worth twenty billion dollars. How we get this number is that we work with Southern California Edison. This is a power company, and uh, we have the the PV generation in in the power network, and we will use either data center or battery to deal with the uncertainty in the renewable generation. We can show a 20 megawatt data center with only 20 percent of flexibility can provide the same voltage uh, violation rate as if we have a three megawatt storage, and this storage is very good. And from this number, we calculate this one. So there are a huge potential, and this is also my my future one of my most important future direction during the following five years. Uh, but the reality is that it's not so good. Right? We have a lot of program design, but but the data center rarely participate. The reason behind this is uh, the huge challenge uh, behind this. Why is uh, uh, the algorithm design for data center operator since this kind of demand response program, usually you have a high uncertainty there. The data center usually, they, they prefer a predefined flat rate. I don't care about what you have in the power network. I just care about, you just give me this fixed rate. That's why it's, a, it's another evidence that people are selfish, right? just, just care about ourselves. And another is that even, that's, that's reasonable, right? We are human, we have the, the limitation on ourselves. But that's really the problem for the market design. Since you know people are selfish, right? Therefore, you should try to design the market so that you provide the right incentive. This is much more important than just a complaint about the selfishness of people. And I'm working on, along both lines for both algorithm and market design. So here is actually an interdisciplinary challenge. And I did have a, a bachelor degree in economics back to Peking University. And uh, this, these two are highly coupled here, right? Assume in the future, if we completely solve the engineering problem, but if we do not have the right market design, it's still useless, right? since you are just doing it right, in the wrong way. But if we, in the future we completely solve the, the economic problem, but with no local control, the economy just, just lying there as a theory. It will not change the world. Yeah, go ahead. Are you aware of the uh, UK market design around constraint payments? Uh, say that again? Are you aware of the UK energy market design around constraint payments? No, not really. Okay. But uh, I, I would be very happy to learn from you about this. <laughs> Since, okay, that's my problem. I, I, I'm more focused on the U, US market. And actually, different you know, different countries have different, quite different uh, policy. For example, for China, we, we have a different approach to solve the problem. Whenever we don't have enough capacity just to build more, that's just uh, one simple sentence for our solution that solves all the problem. It's just a uh, cost is very high. Is that my question? No. Oh, okay. Okay, then the hope is that what, we, what I learned from here, the circle can be also utilized here. And uh, okay, this is also one sentence I, I hope you can remember for my research style. Okay, so over, to overview, my work starts from the data center I work with HP. And for the cloud, and this can be used for the cloud computing, right? So the geographic load balancing. Recently, I work with both Google and Akamai for this part. And this can be also a good candidate for demand response program. And uh, I work with both uh, utility company and also the Berkeley National Lab. Uh, they have a division called Energy and Environmental Division. They offer one postdoc fellowship each year, and uh, this year I got a fellowship. So now nowadays I'm on academic job market. So, uh, but uh, I I already negotiate to defer one year to work on the working in the Berkeley Lab before I started my. Uh, my assistant professor in the university. So this is very important. So they, they are lying at a very good position. I'm not sure how, how much you know about this one, but it's, it belongs to both uh, 
University of California, Berkeley, and also the Department of Energy of the United States. Therefore, they are at a very good position of both industrial, academia, and uh, even the government. So this is very good for my research here. And the, the upper part, it can actually provide opportunity to move bees, not wards, right? When it is beneficial. And we are advising a, a startup to commercialize this idea. And the cloud can be a very good platform for our smart grid option from the, the, the marrying, sensing, and to communication to decision making. OK, my traditional another direction is, of course, networking and system. It's for platform for big data. And uh, I work with Cloud Arrow, and this might be more famous, the App Lab at Berkeley, if you are in the networking and uh, system uh, community. There, uh, I work with Professor Ian Stoika on, on the net, more the data, big data part. And also, there is uh, Professor Rich, uh, Randy Katz and Professor David Cullen. They now have a very interesting project called Software Defined Building. I'm not sure whether you heard that before. <laughs> That's something worth <laughs> mentioning, I think. Yeah. OK. And this one can be also used for smart grid because here we have a human in the loop. Right? Whenever we have human, we need to deal with the behavior of human. And the wish is usually a big data problem to understand the user behavior. Right? Throughout yeah, this part, it will make our IT system more sustainable. And this part is to use IT for the sensibility of our power system. And throughout, this is actually distributed, con real-time control in a distributed manner with uncertain information. Right? OK, before I finish, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues. At Caltech, I'm co-advised by Stephen and Adam. Both of them are amazing advisors. I'm close to finish, but at the, uh, the, although five years, it's already much, a little bit longer than the UK system, but I, I still hope I can learn more from them. It's, it's, it's an amazing experience from them. And also, I work with HP guys and uh, people all over the world. OK, okay I will stop here. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, thank you. I still have another question. Um, have you considered like moving to like a cloud environment where you also have like tenants, uh, giving some models where basically tenants have incentive uh, if their workload is energy aware, energy efficient, or you know, for instance, they provide some uh, you know uh, slack so that you know you can do workload shifting and so on. So, what do you think would be the incentive for tenants to be energy friendly? That's a very good question. So, can you see the challenge again? So the idea is that if uh, you run uh, like a cloud data center, mm -hmm. like, like the workloads mm -hmm. come from the tenant. Yes. So in most cases, it's a black box. So you don't mm -hmm. really have much flexibility mm -hmm. to do workload shifting mm -hmm. or stuff like that. Yes. However, if you expose them to the tenant, some mm -hmm. of the benefits, most of the like, you know, monetary uh, okay. uh, okay. benefits, uh, this might help because the tenant can say, well, you know what? I mean, I'm happy for my workload to be shifted mm -hmm. in the future mm -hmm. if this turns out to be cheaper for okay. myself. OK. I think always a problem can be so either from the economy uh, approach or by regulation. It really depends whether we have the market failure or not. Right. Usually, most of the time, regulation always works. If you have some like tax or nothing, regulations here, it can help. But a more, a more gentle approach is that if you can affect the cost of data center, Right, provide the right incentive to reduce the cost of the data center who use more renewable and renewable energy. Then the data center who use more renewable energy will become more competitive in the market to provide the service with a lower cost. By doing that, we can encourage all the users to utilize that one. But in order to do that, again, it's a problem is whether we can provide the right incentive. And if not, if you, you think there, there have to be a market failure, we have to deal with regulation. Any more questions? 
Mm -hmm. uh, did you do something to try to uh, have a robust solution to your optimization problem? Yes, we do have, but not here. What we have now, there the situation is like, okay, <coughs> HP has a data center in Colorado, and there the electricity bill is four part. The first one is a fixed cost, very small. The second one is the usage charging. It's just the total amount of electricity you use, no matter when you use it. The third one is your peak charging. The last one is coincident peaking charge. What does that mean is by the end of the charging period, for example, the end of the month, at that time, the, the utility company will pick one hour and charge you a very high rate. And that hour is actually the peak hour of the utility as a whole. And they don't know, that's why you, the data center you, you don't know further. Right? And there, the, the robust optimization really matters. Since sometimes you want to have the worst case guarantee. And we also design algorithm with best possible uh, worst case guarantee in terms of comparative ratio there. Yeah. But if you like, we can discuss offline. Uh, I have a general question about, uh, I mean, using IT mm -hmm. in, Okay, clearly uh, we use a lot of energy just to run those data centers, mm -hmm. and you gave some slide in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But I guess many of the services provided by IT mm -hmm. are saving us from doing things in the real world. Okay, instead of sending a letter, I can send an email. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's... instead of sure. shopping yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. to the, to the That's a very interesting uh, story. Yeah. So, yes. do you have an idea of how much we save? Okay. With those services, compared to how much we pay on the, to run them. Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, personally, I that's not my focus. But I know one work very famous is that they compare uh, whether you want to go use uh, okay, what's the service? Okay, for example, YouTube. Whether you want to transform the the video from YouTube or from FedEx, uh, they compare with this cost, and we. Okay, the, the result, again, as you can expect, is it depends. <laughs> it really depends how efficient is our network. Yeah, and uh, it's also a pity that the current uh, communication network, router, that is my home area, is, it's not a power proportional. Yeah, that's also a big problem. And uh, there is that network community, uh, it's it's a big problem for for them. Even the just the, the networking energy consumption to make it more power proportional nowadays is a big challenge. Yeah, like Cisco nowadays, Huawei, right? They are, they are all working on along that line, but it's not so easy. The reason is that the, if you switch on off the the LAN card, it, yeah, they they don't want to do that traditionally. I'm going to ask, um, the, co the energy cost associated with the actual transmission of the data, and obviously there's a trade-off between that and the moving the compute. Is that important? And could your algorithms take it into account? Yes, we can take that into account. But, uh, as I just said, nowadays it's not very powerful proportional. So the, the changing in, in, in network communication power is... Sorry, do I understand that the, the cost of the, tr of the network communications is not dependent on how much data you're transferring? Uh, the power, I should say. The cost is usually dominated by the bandwidth cost, right? Yeah, it's the yeah. bandwidth, not Yes, the but if, if, actually, if we consider bandwidth cost in the optimization problem, we can save even more. Since we can balance just uh, to change your, to, to make your, your, your bandwidth more flat. That can give a further benefit. But in this work, I just use energy as an example to show the benefit. But actually, you can imagine as long as you have more flexibility, you have, you have the ability to, to do the routing in a more flexible way, you can always benefit from given your different objective.